Welcome to the Urban Complex, a system of interrelated emotion charge ideas, feelings, memories, and impulses. This name takes the definition and lays out what a listener should expect. A podcast where ideas, feelings, and memories collide, leading towards meaningful change. I'm co host Chris Richardson. Please enjoy the journey with the Urban Complex. Smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. All opinions by Chris Richardson, Dominic Papa, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arizona State University or the Arizona Commerce Authority. Any endorsement of or messages from sponsors are solely supporting the production of this podcast. There is no relationship further than podcast purposes with any sponsor unless separately created with another entity. All right, Dom, here we are. Well, Chris. It's that time again, Urban Complex. How are you doing? Doing well, man. Doing well. Here we are. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm happy. It's a good, it's a good time of year. I, you know, uh, you know me, I'm a sports guy. Uh, I'm a sports nut. So it, it's, it's just like kind of sweet spot of the year where, you know, our, our professional soccer team, Phoenix Rising, just kicked off last week and had a great first win. Suns are going to the playoffs, right? The, so NBA is leading towards. And looking good, by the way. And, yes, and looking good. <laughs> best, in, Base, best in basketball. Baseball's in full swing. The draft, the NFL draft just happened, which means the season's right around the corner. It's just, it's that like idyllic time of year for a sports nut uh, to just be happy about where it's at and just, you know, see everything, which which leads me into why we're excited about this guest that you're, you've told me that we're bringing on today. Because talk about a sports mecca, I think Boston is probably – if not the biggest sports mech, I mean, Patriots, Red Sox, Bruins, I mean, you name it, you want to go experience sports of love, you go to Boston, right? So I'm excited about this guest that you told me we're bringing on today. Yeah, I I, uh, I got to go to Fenway one time. I've been to see the Celtics there. I, oh, I even lived for a brief. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in Monster. I even lived for a brief uh, stint uh, right outside of Boston uh, for a semester through Northeastern University up in the haunt. So I've experienced the accent, uh, but our guest today, Mitch Weiss, uh, you know, it's amazing. You know, we've heard us reference before our ASU Cloud Innovation Center partner with the Kick, or it's called the Kick, partner with the Amazon Web Services. Um, a group of us, uh, led by uh, our friend Jason Wittet, uh, pulled together this book club, and Mitch Weiss was the author. Um, his book, We the Possibility, it's it's all about harnessing public entrepreneurship to solve uh, most urgent problems. And it was just such a great discussion. And I just couldn't wait. I near the end, I said, hey, we got this, this, this podcast called The Urban Complex. You need to join us. Like what you've done is so amazing. Your experience at Boston, the book you wrote. Um, and he's, he's just such a great guy. He had no problem coming on. And, and so here he is. And uh, hopefully as you meet him, you'll be as excited as me. Yeah, I mean, this is cool. I mean, you, you say public entrepreneurship, that, that's my heart right there. So I'm excited <laughs> I'm excited to see what he's what he's up to, what his story is, and uh, yeah, I'm just ready. Should we bring him on? Let's do it. Let's get him on. All right, here we go. All right, Mitchell, please let Dom and I give you a warm welcome to our podcast, The Urban Complex. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's yeah, gonna be give me a fun fun day here. Thanks for joining. Um, we've we've just found a great recipe is just to get started with the background about you. Uh, our, our audience loves to kind of know the context of where our guests are coming from. So just start there. Like what, what do you want them to know? Um, take your time, make sure you reference, you know, your time at Boston because it is that, that, that area. And we'll get to the book uh, later. So don't, don't, don't uh, rush into that here. Well, my whole life, I've sort of lived at this intersection of trying to do things that uh, solve public problems and work on public stuff at, on one hand, and then also uh, kind of entrepreneurship and, building and invention on the other hand. And it, this, this mix of things goes back a long way. I, I dressed as a voting booth one Halloween as a kid. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I wasn't actually that young. <laughs> wasn't a young kid. Um, so I've always had an interest in, in civic life. And uh, as I said, invention, I, I spent some time uh, uh, in college and, and later interested in computer science and in some other things. That, but ultimately, uh, uh, spent my first uh, instance in government working for the city of Chicago, where I'm from, one summer between my two years in business school, worked in the budget office where, uh, as I joke, uh, all, all good public servants should start. Um, and uh, and then worked for, for Tom Menino, the mayor of Boston during his third term after I finished business school and did a bunch of general policy advising and speech writing and stuff, but also brought some technology into the city, uh, GPS and GIS at the time, which 
I, either dates me or explains how slow city governments are uh, to adopt technologies or, or both. And I, I left city government after about a year and a half. I was in a fellowship there, had a great time, but left to do something else. And then uh, in 2009, the mayor had won election for his fifth term in office, if you can believe it, and um, uh, fell afterwards, actually was laid up. And uh, people are very, he was beloved in Boston, but worried about what a fifth term meant. He was getting older. What's his fresh vision? He asked me to come to uh, be his chief of staff to be his second in command for his last term in office. And I said yes, in part, because I wanted to help out this friend who had fallen. And also because I had spent some time working on and studying open innovation, peer production, Wikipedia was coming of age. And I had been thinking about if we could bring ideas of open innovation into uh, Boston, we could change Boston. If we could change Boston, we could change the world. And so he, when he asked if I would come be his chief of staff, I said yes, but I also said I want to start this thing called the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. It would be the first big city innovation office in Boston, or the first sort of innovation office in Boston, one of the first big city innovation offices in the world. And so I came in to help run the city, worked on a lot of things, but including help uh, co-found with Nigel Jacob and Chris Osgood, the, the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, which people who study smart cities and other things will know of, and um, worked on a bunch of other startups inside City Hall, uh, including uh, including the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, the One Fund Boston, and then the mayor retired, announced his retirement, and I thought about what I wanted to do next. And I had seen all this opportunity from, from uh, entrepreneurship inside a city hall, but also how hard it was. I thought about why it was hard. And, you know, we all know there, there's a myriad of reasons why entrepreneurship and government is hard. But I thought one of those reasons is that we're training people wrong. We're taking people at, at, at policy schools, at government schools who want to go into government. Uh, we're training them mostly to be analysts and strategists at that time. And I thought, well, we need analysts and strategists but we need inventors and builders too. And I thought at business schools, like a Harvard business school where I had gone, we had people who wanted to invent and build, but we weren't telling them you could build for government uh, or build inside government. And I thought, well, that's something I can do. And uh, I uh, ended up in a somewhat of a serendipitous conversation with the Dean of the Harvard business school at the time. He asked me if I was gonna run for mayor to succeed my boss. And I said, no. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, he said, I'll vote for you. I said, well, <laughs> okay, well, that's one. <laughs> uh, few more to go. Yeah, a few more to go, and I'm pretty certain my wife won't even vote for me. Um, so still <laughs> one. Um, so uh, he said, "What are you going to do?" And I sort of told him about the uh, invention and, and building and informal government story. And he said, "Why don't you come do that here?" So that's why now I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. I teach public entrepreneurship. I created a course there on public entrepreneurship. We train young students. We train executives, leaders all around the world in uh, how to be more inventive in government. That's what I do. That's amazing. Uh, you know, Tom and I were both entrepreneurial, kind of this thing, and. You just don't see a lot of it. It's almost like an oxymoron. Uh, another thing that's interesting, you're now the third guest that came from a finance background that found the way in the city. So that might be uh, a, a trend here, which is which is funny to hear. But uh, yeah, so- I'm, so, I'm, I'm just going to say, Chris, I'm sad that you didn't say I'm the third person dressed as a voting booth. Now I'm still alone. <laughs> in that no, that, that one I don't think we will ever find, <laughs> at least as a kid. Uh, although you did say your definition was funny on the kid. Like, <laughs> was that last year? Yeah, it was <laughs> It wasn't last year. No, that would have been timely, though. But no, it wasn't. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, you know, what's, it, what's, what's really interesting, um, we have had a former mayor on the show, uh, but definitely not uh, one that's kind of represented such a large city as Boston. You know, it might help our audience to understand, like, what is the life like of a mayor, especially as big as Boston? I know you you weren't the mayor, but you were the chief of staff for, for such a very prominent mayor there. You know, just, just help. Guess, let, let us get in the minds of, of what a mayor is thinking about um, and, and how a chief of staff makes that happen. I think it'd be a great, great talk. Well, I think the thing that's so interesting about city government and about mayors who lead them, uh, or I suppose city managers in those kind of cities, but is just how close to the ground all the work is. I mean, just how tangible it all is. Uh, you can announce something in the morning and have it be real in the afternoon. And and if you wander into a, a, a bakery or a coffee shop and things aren't going well, streets aren't clean, uh, sidewalks are crap, people, people are gonna let you know. Um, the mayor of St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, Melvin Carter has uh, said, I don't know if he, this was his line, but I've heard, I heard it from him. He said, look, here's the thing about leading in city government. If we're not doing our job, uh, you, you know, uh, you'll know by lunch, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, that's what being a mayor is like. I mean, it's really tangible, really hands-on. And our mayor was just, Mayor Menino was fantastic at having his ear to the ground. He had met 
Chris, more than five, fifty uh, percent of the people who lived in the city personally met. Wow. One half who lived in a city our 50, size. Fifty-five percent, you said. Fifty, more than fifty percent, more than fifty percent. Wow. And so it's very hands-on. And um, and at one level, you have to keep your eye on the big agenda uh, and move the city forward. And on the other hand, of course, all the the various issues uh, uh, of the day are going to pop up: a snowstorm, uh, a you know hur hurricanes, a building collapse, God forbid. Um, fires, homicides, um, on occasion, you know, really horrible things like, like uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. So you have to be somebody who can sort of move the agenda and be responsive at the same time. For chiefs of staff, I, um, chief of staff I think about is the job basically breaks down into three buckets. And one, and this is a line from Andy Carter when he was chief of staff for, for President Bush, but the, the care and feeding of the, of the mayor, you know, making sure that the, all the mayor has is their time and energy. And that's the most important resource the city has in that context. And so how do we make the most use of that? And the, the whole staff that work for me, uh, speech writing, uh, advance, uh, scheduling, it's all about care and feeding of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the, of the mayor. Second bucket is, uh, is ideas. You know, it's very hard when you're running a city to come up with new ideas and to, to push people to come up with new ideas. And so I think that a good chief of staff can help be a font of creativity and and, and, and provide some urgency around that. Certainly that was part of my role. And the third bucket is accountability and results. Mm. And so accountability, as I said, at the high level, you know, what, what are the four or five things we promised in this term and how are we making sure we're moving on those? Um, and then accountability, frankly, at the tactical level, you know, the mayor said he wrote this memo on Tuesday and, and where is it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I thought about the role very much in those three buckets and it differs depending on who your principal is, you know, who the mayor is. But from, for us, uh, the work divided up in those in those three main categories, I, I think. You know, one, one thing, I, I know Don's got some bunch of questions, but one thing you didn't listen to that list of things you didn't expect is like a, you know, Netflix brought to the forefront a very high profile uh, art heist. You know, I, I, I would imagine that, uh, that that would be a subject of the mayor too. No, I'm just kidding. I just, I just watched that, uh, that show the other day. It's pretty well. My friend is one of the uh, uh, executive producers of that uh, film really? and, and uh, my kids are into it, but they say that we can't watch it before bed because it's a little too, uh, a little too scary for them. It is pretty dark. <laughs> there's there's this undertone of uh, scariness. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love, I'm loving this conversation, Mitchell. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm uh, almost geeking out a little bit because, you know, when we started the smart city, smart region movements here, uh, years back, it, it was really unknown. And I modeled a lot of my thinking off of the Boston office of urban mechanics. And so, to, to hear you say that you had a, you know, a hand in that is just absolutely incredible. And we've always admired what you were able to do there in Boston. So on that note, I mean, would you mind talking about your view of smart cities? You know, what, what are they in your opinion, you know, and what's working, what's not, you know, around the country or even in Boston? So uh, if it's okay without losing a new friend here, Dom, I, I don't love the smart cities um, oh. uh, uh, framing. Um, and I, I think we could all acknowledge it hasn't mostly lived up to its, its promise either. So Definitely um, not. <laughs> uh, I think when we started the mayor's office of new urban mechanics, um, uh, so, so one thing that's kind of fun, so it's called new urban mechanics, you know, like why people, where the name come from? Well, the mayor's nickname was the urban mechanic because when he was elected to office, he used to just drive around the city with a note card in his hand, um, in his pocket. This was back in 1993 when he was elected writing down, you know, potholes and, and, uh, and the like. And of course, over time, uh, you know, that became more automated. Uh, but uh, when we decided to create this newfangled office, that was going to be about innovation. He wasn't really a tech guy, uh, Mayor Menino. We decided we had to name it after him so he would like it. Mm -hmm. And so we just called it New Urban Mechanics. Um, and so, but in there, there's like a really important insight, I think, for smart, that the smart cities folks mainly missed which is he wasn't just about potholes and, and, and street lights. He was about this other thing I mentioned earlier, which is he knew half the people who lived in the city. He was a mayor who was all about engagement. So if we were going to build a tech office, you know, or an innovation office, it was going to be about engagement. It was going to be about, you know, peer production. It was about neighbors helping out neighbors. And so I think that's a lot of what the smart cities movement missed. It was very top down. It was very tech driven as opposed to being bottoms up, human oriented, human centered, problem centered, right? When you say smart cities, like, if you think about the top, my, my boss, the mayor, we sit in his beautiful office uh, across from Fanny, looking out of Fanny Wall. And if we brought in something that sounded overly wonky, he would just point out the window and he'd say, what do those people care about that? What does that word mean to them? There's nobody who ever walked down a street 
in a city who said the thing I desire is a smart city. Mm. They, they said um, the thing I desire is, is, uh, is clean streets or safe streets or productive schools or, or food security or something else. And so smart cities should never have been an objective. And um, I, don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it's the most, um, the most productive framing. So, I, you know, I think we completely agree with that, your framing around smart cities and, and kind of its lackluster history. But I think you brought up a good point, which is a perfect segue, you know, in, into your book, We the Possibility, all about problems, right? And, and, you know, leveraging, harnessing public entrepreneurship to solve problems. So please, please share with the audience, you know, why you wrote the book, you know, and, and what's the general overview of it and, and give some background on, on it. So the... The event that sort of catapulted me into writing the book was was the bombing of the Boston Marathon in 2013. Um, you know, Patriots Day in Boston, the best the best day of the year, shattered in two instances as as two bombs went off at the finish line and lives were ended on that street and, and lives upended hundreds of them. Um, and but but the the good thing that starts happening, the amazing thing that starts happening right after that is all this generosity starts flowing in from around the world. How can we help? To where can we send money? And normally what happens is the big established institution in town, a big foundation collects and distributes funds after a mass shooting or a terrorist attack like that. And we happen to know that that's actually a pretty slow process. Mm. It had been well over a hundred days since the horrible shootings at Sandy Hook where all those kids had been killed and their teachers and not a penny had made it to their families yet. And it was never going to bring back those kids, but it was intended for them. And so we decided we were going to do something new, start our own new fund. And I was on the phone with the head of our local established institution, actually a very good person, about our hundred, you know, a century year old, you know, century old foundation in town. The morning after the bombings, we were at the hospital. The mayor was going to visit survivors. And I'm, I'm being yelled at over the telephone. You can't start your own new fund. You'll raise less money. Government can't start something new. And we did anyways. We were up and running that night on a, on a PayPal account. So just over 24 hours after the, uh, the bombs had gone off and, and that morning the next day on a, uh, with the post office box. And um, uh, eventually we collected and distributed $60 million in 75 days, which made it the fastest relief effort of its kind in the history of our, our country. And um, a year later, two, two survivors asked me to tell them the story of how One Fund Boston came to be. And I told them a longer version of the story. I just told the two of you. And they said, oh, you have to tell the story to other people. And I said, it's not my story to tell. I didn't save anybody's lives. I didn't get hurt. Uh, and uh, they said, you have to tell that story to other people. You have to show people government can do new things. So I was left with this question, really, which is, well, which is it? Is it what the survivors had experienced and benefited from, which was it could do new things? Is it what the foundation had had said, which most of us have seen most of the time, it feels like, which is government can't do new things. And so I spent the last eight years or so trying to sort that out. Uh, traveling all around the world, trying to understand, you know, can we, can we solve public problems anymore? And uh, the book is basically my answer to that question, which is, yes, we can, government, can, you know, we can, but it will require a, a massive shift in mindset to what I end up, uh, to what I end up describing as, uh, as possibility government. Hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing Genesis story. Uh, I, I curiosity, how did you use the funds? Like, you didn't kind of close there. I know it led to the book, but like, Really interesting. Like, where did you apply it? We just gave them out to the survivors to do with whatever they want. It was want. all survival. Wow. So it's just a quicker pass through of collecting relief, getting into those in need. That's amazing. Okay. So, it's, yeah, so, very that? it's very unusual. Very fact, unusual. The IRS, yeah. the IRS didn't, doesn't really want you to do that. Um, and it, and they, it was, it's a much longer story than we have here, but, but very complicated to just give money uh, to the survivors to do with what they want as quickly as you can. But we thought it was very important, and so we did. Yeah, that's well. Okay, so on the book side, let's dig a little deeper than just how it got started. Like, um, you know, when I, I read it, that's actually how we met in, in the book club that uh, one of my colleagues organized it was amazing. And I remember the reach out to reach up section, um, and and I just I kept thinking to myself, you know, while, while I'm not technically in a city right now, Arizona State University, where where a university is, I understand these industries, this sector of public sector, 
Um, there's a lot of sets quo. One thing why ASU is really differentiating itself through innovation that's really resonating in the marketplace. We've been innovation, number one innovation six years in a row now. But I got the impression that, you know, clearly there's a little bit of staleness in the thinking of the status quo in the public sector. And um, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you had in mind, but just tell us what was behind that chapter. And more importantly, like, what is the mindset you're looking to instill? Because I think that's a, a, a big piece of what I, what I read. Right. So, so the book starts out with, with, these, with these two chapters on, on um, why we're a little bit stuck or more than a little bit stuck on old ideas and where we might go for new ones. And um, it's the beginning of a, of a description of government that I call probability government, where we do things that will probably work, but they lead to sort of middling or mediocre outcomes. They're not really up to the task if we're being honest about it. And, and I make the argument over and over that we need to move away from that in, in more instances, not in every instance, but in more places and more times and more programs towards possibility government where we, where we do things that will only possibly work um, because they're new and novel. Um, and new and novel things mostly don't work. But if we, if we, if we did uh, try them and succeeded with some of them, ultimately we would solve our problems. So, uh, I, I, so you asked about the mindset. The mindset we have in government mostly is a probability mindset. And I think the mindset we need more places is a possibility mindset. And why, we're, why we have a probability mindset, why we're so oriented towards the status quo. Um, people have different ideas about this. One thing people will say is, well, government is risk averse, okay? Government really isn't risk averse as an entity. Nobel Prizes have been awarded in part on the basis of the fact that government is actually probably most well situated to take on uh, risk. It's by virtue of its size, its taxing authority. Um, uh, my colleague, David Moss has written at length about how well positioned it is to absorb and spread risk. But the people in government, the people in government are risk averse. Now the, the main reason they're risk averse is because they're human, <laughs> is, is because they're people, but uh, all of us are risk averse, we're wired that way. But in addition, maybe they've selected into this, this work that feels somehow more stable and certainly they're held more, you know, so more accountable by, by the press and the public. And so there's all sorts of reasons why people get afraid to try new things. Um, but I think we have to move past it because, because the status quo isn't working in so many places. We just have to be clear eyed that the status quo is not working when it comes to preparing people for the future, when it comes to making sure uh, that we're, you know, uh, that our, <laughs> our planet will be here, when it comes to making sure um, that, uh, that, that people are fed and, and schooled. And so um, we're stuck, we're mired in status quo, partly because we're human, partly because we're humans who are being constantly um, scrutinized by other humans and the press, and, and we, should, we, we, we need to be scrutinized, but, um, but that's led us to be stuck. And uh, what we need is for, uh, for the public to understand that it's gonna be okay to try new things and to even encourage that and to even co-participate in that and provide a new kind of scrutiny, a new kind of accountability, which is not to say people in public can try everything they want willy-nilly, mm -hmm. but to say, if you try new things and you don't waste too much time and you don't waste too much taxpayer money in trying them, then if those things fail, uh, but you still take the lessons on other things, we won't, we won't throw you out of office uh, or we won't drag you in front of a uh, you know, hearing or skewer you in the press. And so. I, uh, I start in those early parts of the book, as you allude to, Chris, to, to try to argue that we need to move from a probability mindset uh, to a possibility mindset. And, and that part of that part of the uh, reaching out aspect of this is, is where do you go for new ideas? If you're going to start possibility, start with ideas. Where do you go outside the confines of City Hall and uh, the State House and the White have House? You, have, have you seen that um, those you've talked to resonate with that view when they're inside it, like, do they, do they acknowledge that, that, uh, that it is more of a probability mindset where they're kind of working towards what they know will work, but that's really in, in, in an outcome. Almost universally people acknowledge that's sort of mostly what we do. Um, and I don't get too many, too many, you know, arguments about that as a diagnosis where you see people diverge is on the solution. So I've certainly had public officials, mayors who, when I talk about possibility government, they get very excited. You know, I've, I've had, uh, there was just a new mayor elected in, uh, uh, in, in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I know he's, his um, uh, colleague, you know, they, uh, colleagues of his sent copies of the book to all their new leadership. Yeah, I'm sure he's gonna be pushing a possibility agenda. The mayor of St. Paul, I mentioned earlier, 
when he announces a whole suite of public safety uh, uh, transformation efforts in his city, says, look, it's not all going to work. I mean, think about that. Think about being in St. Paul, the city next to Minneapolis, where this whole public safety issue is so fraught and announcing you're going to change a bunch of stuff and announcing much of it's not going to work. So, or some of it's not going to at first. And so there are public leaders who respond really well. There are also yeah, public well, leaders, just to be clear, who have said to me, you know, Mitch, it's not your name in the newspaper, you know? Uh, and, and I can tell that they feel like, oh, you've been gone from City Hall too long. You're naive. This isn't realistic. So I don't want to pretend like everybody accepts it or it's going to be easy. Uh, and certainly there have been um, public officials who say, in real life, I, I can't try stuff that's not going to work. Uh, that, that's, that's too dangerous. Yeah. All right. So the other part of the book that I've particularly found um, really interesting being a technology person uh, was what's the platforms and, and network effects uh, from them. And um, so the, the chapter, I think, was called Government as Platform. So tell us what, what you believe, what, what's your premise with that chapter and, and how do we get that reality to come to fruition? I, th I think scale from change, if you want to go from that last part the, from probability to possibility, if you can get this government as a platform, that's that, that, that then leads to massive outcomes. But tell us. Right. So I think that's, for me, the motivation uh, was possibility government. We need new ideas. Yes. If we have those ideas, we need to be able to try them, which is, uh, we just talked about is hard to do, but we need to sort the good ones from the bad ones and try them. And then we need to be able to scale them because, because we're not going to solve the problems we have if it's just a bunch of little new programs lying around. And I think most of us would recognize that's a lot of what we've had too often. And um, so that was part of the reason for really wrestling with scale has to be a part of this formula. Platforms as a toolkit for scale are enticing, although, although risky, in part because my experience in government was if, if, you were, if you had started some new program in government, say you know, uh, a, a program for getting fresh vegetables to, to, to Amer you know, Americans of low income or something, or in, in Bostonians of low income. And you got $50,000 for, you know, for it last year and you served a hundred people or I mean, a thousand people, let's say, or whatever. And you go to the mayor and say, I want to double this, you know, I, the mayor says, I'd like you to double the program. They say, we need double the money. And that's just not the way you think in the tech world. You don't scale things linearly because there aren't the resources to do that. And certainly not in government are there the resources to do that. We have to figure out how we scale things exponentially. And so platforms afford us that, that opportunity. So that's why the metaphor is so enticing. And then Tim O'Reilly had written this, this in our little world, a pretty important article about government as a platform and pointed out that uh, throughout history, when government has acted as a platform, it's, uh, it's enabled uh, uh, change at a massive scale and points out high, you know, roadways and highways are a great example of this government um, uh, lays the roadway. And so the first person on the road uh, now benefits if someone else moves on the road next door, if a store opens up down the street, if a museum, if a restaurant, government didn't open up the restaurant, the museum, didn't build the house next door, but government laid the architecture. And, uh, and so roads have these incredible network effects and they have really strong positive network effects until you get traffic and then they have negative network effects. But um, <laughs> But roads are a great example of a platform and a reminder that governments were, were platform builders before Airbnb and Uber were. And I think the, the logic there of platforms for scaling, of network effects for scaling is so important if we're going to solve problems uh, that really help everybody. And so that was, the, that was my motivation for, for, for uh, moving there in the, in, in the book and along the, the, the road, if you're pardon the pun, towards possibility government is how do, we, how do we think about government not providing services in an analog or linear fashion, you know, one to one, but building the architecture with some software, some hardware, some good rules, some good process, where they uh, where things can scale. And importantly, importantly, especially in this day and age, where people can make each other better off. Like, shouldn't that be the best metaphor for government at all? Which is we build stuff where each additional person makes everybody else better off. Yeah, I, I, that's phenomenal. I, you know, I'm loving this conversation because I've been advocating heavily here in Arizona about this idea of just let's build, you know, emerging technology platforms. That's, that's the role we should be playing. So, you know, we do have a lot of city managers, CIOs that are listening to our podcast because they want to hear the stories and they want to, you know, get advice on how they might do things better in their community. So, you know, with the context that you just provided, what are you seeing, you know, what elements of your book 
might be best applied to cities? Is it, uh, I mean, what advice would you give? Is it to start with the mindset or is it to uh, start to think about, you know, the, the platform aspects of it? Where, what advice would you give leveraging kind of the elements of your book? My first advice would be if you want to start on the road towards possibility, you start by, uh, by being clear about the status quo is, is often the more dangerous choice. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you start talking about possibility, people will say new stuff is risky. And you have to be, if you're a CIO, a mayor, a city manager, a president, a prime minister, or whatever you are, you have to say the status quo is actually also uh, in, in the dangerous choice. In fact, sometimes more. You have to break down the... The, this, the, the thing that feels axiomatic, which is the new thing is riskier. That's where you start. Then once you've done that, I think you go in the sequence of, of government that I can imagine, you know, we need to go out, we need to go find new ideas. Where do you look for new ideas? Users, uh, the crowd, sometimes action, sometimes you do stuff to generate ideas. That, that's step two. Step three is figuring out how we can try things. You build, build, measure, learn your way through. Stop if you're a CIO or again, or mayor, prime minister, or whatever, stop with these five and 10 year uh, you know, projects, 500 page RFPs that, that uh, we finally deliver something, you know, years hence that aren't responsive to the problem we faced when we started and got no input from the public along the way. Stop doing that. Start build measure learning our way through, figure out ways to resolve your uncertainties early on. Uh, and then, and then, and then this point about government as a platform, then, then build ways for scaling and ideally think about ways to create uh, network effects. Think about ways to where the second or third person will make the first person better off and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, my advice. Um, other advice is start actually, this is, this is counterintuitive, but I say start where citizens can see you. People's tendencies when they start on this stuff is to want to start in the back office because it feels safer. You know, we're going to be innovative, but we'll be innovative around the procurement system. You will not get the energy you need from the public if, that's, if you're doing it all behind the scenes. And so I, I start on stuff. You that go from 500 pages to 460 pages. Yeah, right, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll be, <laughs> Exactly. When the wall celebrate how we got it, we, we cut 30 pages. Um, not that I don't think procurement systems need, need to be reformed. By the way, I think if we're going to really get to possibility, we need to change our talent, uh, our, our talent system and change our, our procurement system. But it's not the place I would start. Um, you got to build up momentum on issues that that really improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. And start. That's my other advice, uh, uh, Don. I'd start. I'd start on the stuff that matters in people's daily life. Yeah, it's really amazing. Well, okay, so you know we could have you on all day. I, I know um, we we we've definitely learned stuff. When you were talking about the mayor's nickname was actually the, the urban mechanic. Like both of our eyes popped that that's where the name came from. It's quite well. Uh, the book's amazing. Your experience in Boston didn't even realize you had some experience in Chicago uh, during business school. Um, love the entrepreneurship side, but like like I said, we could have you on forever. We'll have to get you back when you uh, maybe see some of your, your, uh, the students you're teaching come out with this amazing thing that actually uses the book that turns into the most amazing idea. Have you come in with the entrepreneur or something, but, um, we, we do kind of wrap things up. We, we know you didn't do it alone. I mean, is there anyone that you want to kind of call out that really helped change the trajectory of your growth path? I don't know. Maybe it was your parent telling you that you probably shouldn't wear the, the, uh, the voting booth for the next year or something, but like, uh, I don't know. Where, where would you start so that, uh, that, that you can help people um, understand kind of how, how, you, how you change the game with hope? You know, um, I've mentioned the mayor. I, you mentioned my students. I would say I started this course of, of public entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School, and people told me it was a really bad idea. Uh, why would you start a course on public entrepreneurship at a business school? And those first students that walked into the room, I said, if we do this, we're going to do it together. And so all of them, uh, I, I'm so grateful for. And uh, and then I would say um, to my wife and to my kids, some of my favorite words in the book are the words my kids wrote at the very end. Uh, my kids are nine and seven. Um, and because they talked about how we could make better things and solve problems in the world. And if we can inspire nine and seven year olds, that government still has a positive role to play. Mm -hmm. We can inspire 19 year olds who need to see that like, like, like me, they had interest in entrepreneurship and public service and they can combine them. And we can survive, you know, we can also uh, uh, inspire the 29 year olds and the 59 year olds and the 79 year olds. But I, I want a generation of young people to see that they can combine their interest in, in entrepreneurship and technology. You know, they grew up all as digital natives and it's serving the public. And if we can do that, we can, um, that, that would probably be the highest order uh, purpose for the book. If we can attract a new generation. Hey, you're, you're right. I mean, that section of the book where you're talking about that government 
should be one of the most innovative places and the smartest and the best should come out of the woodwork. It just, just made me feel like I'm in the right place, this kind of mix of this public sector, private sector, gov uh, opportunity. Like, because there is so much opportunity. That's a really great, great, great point. Um, okay, so and as we as we wrap up, is there anyone, as you've learned about Dom and I and the, and the urban complex, is there anyone you think we should get on the show? I mean, we're always open to amazing, amazing perspective like you of, of who we should invite out. So you know who you should have on. Um, so um, Mariana Matus and Nusha Gailey started a company called Biobot Analytics, which you may know of. They they spun it out of some re research they were involved in at MIT and the idea was, could we basically gather data from sewage, from our, our poop and pee, and really understand the nature of city and city health. And the earliest use cases were for opioid um, uh, uh, addiction, and later on for, for COVID, they pioneered in many ways this hmm. wastewater epidemiology and, and trying to figure out where, whether cities were up or down on COVID when they didn't have testing. And I, I find the two of them fascinating. I think you'd love having them on. I also think that it's such an amazing example of possibility because when they started on opioids, the probability way of, uh, of dealing with the opioid addiction in the city, right, the, the sort of sort of tried and true way, but, but when we know it wasn't up because people were dying everywhere, was we'll, we'll wait till they die and then we'll know how much overdose there is or we'll wait till they call 911 and we'll know how much overdose there is. And that's what cities would have kept doing. And Nusha and Mariana said, well, what if we could tell them earlier? What, what if we could, what if somehow we get access to the sewers, access to the water in there, the sewage in there, turn that sewage into data, make that data useful via great visualizations. And, and, and then they had to have possibility counterparts in Cambridge and Boston, later in Cary, North Carolina, later in all these other cities on COVID to say, okay, we'll try something new. So I, I find them there's to be a fascinating example of this possibility, um, probability, possibility dichotomy. And the two of them are just uh, so intriguing. I think you'd, uh, given all that you, got, you two think about and, 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 and do and study, I think you'd really enjoy them. Love it. Well, well, with that, thank you. Uh, the Urban Complex gives a big note of thanks to today's guest, uh, Mitch Weiss, author of We the Possibility and former Chief of Staff to Boston's Mayor, Thomas Nino. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right, Dom, that was Mitch. What do you think? Yeah, uh, man, what a great conversation. What a great person to meet. Thanks for bringing him on. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, in the kind of the interview, when we were building our smart city program here in the smart region effort and now the smart state effort, it was all about how do we get you to think like a public entrepreneur? How do we get you to really be innovative? And as I mentioned, I looked around at best practices of cities doing this, Barcelona, Boston, and I literally almost copied word for word the, the office of the, the new urban mechanic because that's exactly what we are trying to expound here. So it was really interesting for me to to hear about how that actually started, because to me, I think we're 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 trying to drive something that's innovative now, like oh, be an entrepreneur in government right now, and it's still met with some resistance. Could you imagine in, <laughs> when he was trying to start this oh, entire new office? Can't imagine <laughs> what 15, 20 years ago. Like, holy cow! Well, he even told us off camera that the the the, the that that program almost didn't start because the group around the mayor is like, we can't do that. Exactly. And he's like, He's like, bullshit, we can't. Like, exactly. you definitely exactly. can't do it if you don't try it. <laughs> so. Exactly. And it took someone like him to just push it through, right? And that's what yeah. all this is about is one, thinking differently, but then two, being bold and confident enough to when you get pushed back to just keep pushing through. He didn't stop when they said, no, we can't put this in his inaugural speech. He said, yes, we can. And guess what? They did it. And now history is history, right? So, so excited for his leadership. And I think others can really take a lesson learned on how to start like it yeah you, you might get pushback from either internal external stakeholders but if you think you have a great idea that can really change your organization go for it uh and the rest will follow so i thought that was great too i love the name of it because i always wondered when i was you know researching and doing this i was like what is new urban mechanic what does that even mean i don't really understand it <laughs> the fact that they literally the mayor would drive around in his car with a notepad and just <laughs> write down yeah. our eyes the, popped oh, when he said it was, it was great <laughs> hold on history i'm going to tell the public works guy about this you know so I, I i just thought that was great and lastly i mean chris you know me I, i'm such a, a fan about this idea of public entrepreneurship and, and the fact that he's actually teaching a class at Harvard, hopefully, to your point, maybe uh, we can recruit him here because 
I mean, think about if, if, if he's developing the next generations of mayors and city managers and CIOs that have a possibility mindset instead of a probability mindset, our cities are going to become the platforms for the best. And Dr. Crow, hopefully you're listening. Jimmy Choi, hopefully you're listening. Sanjeev, Dean of Thunderbird, hopefully you're listening. <laughs> we got we got to get this guy. <laughs> totally, totally. So, I mean, what, what was your takeaway? What was your thing? Well, I, you know, first of all, it's the title of a book, you know, I, I remember when you and I and uh, the CIO of the state of Arizona were talking, we see this thing uh, on his uh, shelf. We're like, we're going to have that, the, the, the author of that on, our, on, the, on the show. So him explaining why he called that we the possibility, the probability mindset versus the possibility mindset. Um, I, I thought that just was stark, right? You, you get these folks that are in the probability world where they're like, okay, we can make that happen. We know we'll be successful. What's well, kind of like your goals and objectives in any organization? Anytime you're doing layups, you, you know you're likely going to make it, but it doesn't change. It doesn't change the trajectory. So I thought his explanation of what was went into the title was really important. First of all, yeah. No, I, I, then, I, I, I just I, yeah, I just found his like that that approach is so unique. You know, it's it's it, we have to think differently. We have to take risks and be okay with risks. And I actually I thought. Because, you know, all we do is hear about, oh, governments are risk averse. He was like, no, actually, we're better positioned than anyone to actually take risks on. So I thought that was very interesting to, to hear. That. Well, and, and I love this part. He called it on the road to possibility. Oh, yeah. That you need to start with the probability is actually more risky. Not changing is more risky. And I tend to agree. There's a lot of yeah. industries that aren't changing or, or at least groups in that industry that aren't changing. Uh, in industries, either higher education, cities, like if, if you're not going to shift, you can find yourself or either your citizens leave or your students leave, right? So so I, I, I thought, first of all, that identifying that. And then I, I do, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also a builder. Like you got to imagine the idea, but ideas are a dime a dozen, right? So if, if you can't um, then test your idea, you got to build a little bit of it. You got to test it, you got to build it. And then you got to scale it. And he calls it the build, measure, learn yeah. model. I think that's really, really, really great advice. As well as do it, start where the citizen can see you. Meaning don't do it in the back office, but test things out in public and show the citizen that you really are listening to them and you care and you're moving the needle. I mean, I think that goodwill builds and, and it creates this kind of flywheel effect that you can do amazingly more than wait four years to develop your five-year plan and then show that you did the first thing in it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it falls out well, you know, even Mike, you know, Mike Grisby last week talked about, you still have to do the unsexy work, the back end work, yep. but he said, you also need to do the front, the, the, you know, the citizen facing, because if not, then you'll never move. And so his point was well taken that, yeah, you still have to do something that touches the citizens, but then, you know, don't, don't focus on, cutting the procurement from 400 pages to 398 pages. Like let's do something that's actually people care about to move the needle and get, and get momentum built. Right. I think a lot of times in government and the public sector, it's all about momentum. How do you, how do you start the ball down the hill? Right. Once you do, then great things happen. But the, the, the heavy lift for usually governments and probably universities is getting the ball started. Right. So many people want to say no. So many people want to say, well, you have to follow this process to even start something, you know, that, there's just so many barriers to just starting something that sometimes people just say it's not worth it. And then I think that's why we get stuck. Right. So I thought this was great. Yeah. And I think the last thing that got me pumped is, is also, it probably resonated with you because you, you're, we're, we're cloth. You started the entrepreneurship, but why, why is the inspiration there? Like, why are we excited to get started? Why, why should people see government as the big possibility area and I mean, his book, he really does talk about, he thinks this is the big frontier, uh, well, one, one, one of a few, and we need, a, we, we need some more of the brightest minds to tackle it. And, uh, you know, I just think if we can inspire our audience to see differently, which we've been trying to do with stories, I mean, it's literally in the book, he's, he's got this now entrepreneurship, he's teaching at Harvard, I know we do a ton here at ASU, you and I, we're doing it through the, the various mediums and, and that we're trying to influence. So I, I just think inspiration is really important. Yeah, loved it. A great, great person to bring on. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, Cracks and Payment, what do you got for us? I believe it's your turn to bring something to the table. Yeah, so let me grab the article I found. Uh, 
It's an interesting title. I think it can go a bunch of ways. It's a uh, grist is the publisher. I don't, I'm not sure what that is, but it's, it says in America's cities, inequality is ingrained in the trees. And it's basically a new study finds that low income blocks have less tree cover and hotter average temperatures than high income ones. Wow. It's incredible. I mean, I, I love these sorts of, um, you know, stories or these articles or these data points, honestly, because sometimes it, it, you, you don't even know what you don't know, right? You don't know that, oh yeah, we just never thought about planting trees there. Oh yeah, we, we will always plant trees in downtowns and where people travel, which are usually what high income, well to do, but we never think, oh, can we do the same in other areas of the well, I mean, think, think about it from downtown Phoenix, where you live, and, and yeah. I spent some time, we've seen the revitalization of, of ASU, but I know, uh, you know, Duke Ryder, and like, I know they consciously thought about how do they put enough tree canopy so that it went to 120 degrees here in the summer, um, that it actually absorbs some of that craziness so it doesn't get as hot, and the asphalt doesn't get as hot, and more importantly, the people are out there. We've talked on the show about walkability, and right. if you don't have the canopy there, uh, in some places, I grew up in Seattle, you don't have the canopy to kind of protect from, from the rain here for, from the heat, like people aren't going to be outside, not to mention the aesthetic appeal. Uh, we've also heard many of our guests talk about the quality of life that's there. I mean, people naturally want to see nature too, although yeah. it drives me nuts when we plant these ones that kill me with the allergies. We're just getting over that. I know you mentioned spring in our kickoff, like, oh, uh, that's the downside of the trees. But I, I don't know, I there's so much to this cracks in the pavement idea about oh, canopy. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, if there are a way to really talk, talk about his crowdsourcing thing where he was finding ways to take money um, and get it to where people need, I bet you people would love to, to contribute to a planted tree in a, in a lower income neighborhood, knowing that this had some sort of impact. So I don't know, when I read it, I, I could apply it to so many ways. It's kind of a really intriguing thing that went in line with a you know, stronger or smart city for a stronger tomorrow type thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and th I think this just highlights why we call it the urban complex. I mean, think about how complex of an issue that is. Like to most citizens, probably most city managers, they're not thinking, oh, am I planting enough trees in low income neighborhoods? So that just, that is not, you know, the number one topic that's probably popping. Oh, what was the nickname for the urban? The, ur the urban jungle, right? Like, yeah, it, exactly. and it was it was not it was concrete jungle. It wasn't it wasn't truly a jungle, right? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It's like it takes an article like this to bring it to your attention to be like, oh, we have never thought about not planting trees. That you know, so it's, cities are so complex. There's so many of these issues that you you know, a city manager was like, oh, did did we did we mess up by not thinking about planting trees in low income neighborhoods? Maybe, but maybe it never just came to the forefront, you know, in the conversations because cities are so complex. There's always, uh, you know, an issue. But to his point is, how do you build the platform so when the issue comes to your head, comes to it, comes to the city, now you say, okay, how do we solve it, right? And I think that's exactly what we're trying to do with these stories. Is just, hey, how do you build the capacity, the platforms, the organizational structure, so that way when a new complex issue comes, like planting trees in low-income neighborhoods. Now you can have a system to solve it, right? And okay. I think that's, that's well, well, if any of our guests like like this theme, it looks like the Nature Conservancy, a gentleman named Rob McDonald, lead scientist, kind of ran this, and they found poor Bridgeport, Connecticut. They had the most disparity. Uh, five blocks away, they could literally see four degrees Celsius change versus the high income blocks and the low income blocks. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge difference wow. in yeah. temperature. I mean, it's wild. It's it's a a yeah, that's the difference between like 115 and 100. Yeah. Uh, 40, so, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, no, great article. I, I think that's great. Again, I think this is why we're excited to, to actively seek other kind of sponsors that want to bring us these sorts of ideas around cracks in the pavement. Like what are the issues that maybe cities aren't thinking about that, they need to start thinking about what or are they highlight the best practices again it's like those sub stories uh that may not be as sexy as some of the smart city stuff but like again i think it's important totally cool awesome all right well that's a wrap thanks all yeah that was great see you next time thanks for listening to the urban complex smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow please find us on where you listen apple podcasts spotify or youtube we do love your feedback let us know if you have ideas for guests or questions to air on Cracks in the Pavement via social media. The Urban Complex is found on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Or just shoot me an email, chris at theurbancomplex.com. 
until next time.